You're listening to ReachMD XM160, the channel for medical professionals. Welcome to coverage of the 2009 Games for Health Conference in Boston, Massachusetts. Here is ReachMD host Dr. Matthew Bernholtz. The fifth annual Games for Health Conference brought together hundreds of game developers and health professionals to explore the use of game technology in health and healthcare. Principal uses of games in healthcare include empowering patients to better manage their own health conditions, as well as shaping how healthcare providers are trained and how they deliver care. Ben Sawyer is a co-founder of the Games for Health Conference. The need for something like the Games for Health Conference is sort of similar to what you would get in many emergent spaces, be they technical or social, but something where something is very early, requires community and coordination and sharing and collaboration in order for that emergent space to grow at a faster rate and with a higher level of quality. So what we're doing with the Games for Health conference is bringing together all of these sort of early adopters, researchers, developers, of people who are interested in using video games and video game technologies to improve health and healthcare. Hope Lab, a nonprofit that works in this innovative area, has been distributing a game for young cancer patients called Remission since 2006. The story of the game is that you are piloting a microscopic robot named Roxy who's battling cancer at the cellular level. Her job in various missions is to blast away at leukemia cells or to battle bacterial infections within the human body. And kids really love that immersive experience. But what they're learning is that just as Roxy needs to keep her chemotherapy gun armed in order to successfully kill every cancer cell in a level, you have to take your pills and medications that they're prescribed in order to be able to fight cancer. So through that experience, young people are learning the types of behavior that are important. And we've researched whether or not this has real impact in their outcomes. And we see really encouraging positive results. Richard Tate of Hope Lab says that games, including remission, present unique ways to reach patients. Games are a really great way to engage people uh, in an active way in their own health care. In particular, young people who spend a lot of time with games and are native to this technology. Uh, we chose the game vehicle uh, as a way to reach kids where they're at, so to speak. For young cancer patients, uh, they're delivered a lot of information, tough information, a lot of it that doesn't make sense when you're 13, 14, 15 years old. And oftentimes at that age of life, it's hard to hear things from adults, parents, doctors, particularly when it applies to behavior, when they're asking you to do something that isn't fun, or if you, they're asking you to take medications that make you feel sick. Games were a way to really deliver information in almost a stealthy way, not uh, by giving them a menu of screens in which they're asked to do multiple choice, but by actually living out different experiences and contingencies in the environment of a game to understand why certain behaviors are important to their health. A new version of Remission is being developed by a company called Virtual Heroes. Jerry Hennigan is managing director. The goal of Remission 2 is to make the game more fun and by proxy more beneficial for patient users. Where we're at right now is involved in several initiatives. Some of them involve strategic messaging and behavior modification. We're doing two projects. Uh, one is with Warner Brothers in Africa and PEPFAR for HIV awareness. The other project is with Hope Lab for teaching uh, young people with cancer what's happening in their bodies and to give them a sense of you know, how they can help to combat that. You know, The other thing we're involved in is just simple procedural and cognitive medical training and education, uh, training everyone from EMTs to nurses and physicians on the skills that they need to be successful and proficient in their workplace. Says Hennigan, it's a very exciting time to be recreating new forms of interactions. And what we're trying to do is create compelling visceral experiences that are fun that by being used uh, produce a positive training effect. And so, you know, we're starting to see platforms coming out that include dynamic virtual human characters that are physiologically, pharmacokinetically, biomechanically accurate, that also link to learning management systems and things like uh, after-action review mechanisms and authoring tools so that folks can learn to train either through individual self-paced instruction or dynamic team training over the Internet. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to coverage of the 2009 Games for Health Conference held in Boston on ReachMD XM160, the channel for medical professionals. The video game widely credited as the first medical video game, called Microsurgery, was developed in 1982 by Richard Levine, 
Basically, you got different patients. You could select any, I think it was 199 different patients. And the patients had different parts of the body where they had problems. Uh, they had cholesterol in the arteries, they had uh, tar in the lungs, they had tumors, they had tapeworms, uh, all kinds of little diseases that you use three medicines or three uh, tools that you could work on with the patient. One was a ultrasonic laser or ultrasonic device. Another was aspirin, and another was antibiotics for the bacteria in the body. Levine says the technical limitations, while advanced for the time, seem primitive by today's standards. There were a lot of technological limitations. In 1982, the game came out, uh, I think it was around November, and it basically came out on Mattel and television, which the cartridge had 8K of memory. The computer uh, inside of the machine ran at one megahertz. Today's machines run at something like three gigahertz which is three billion compared to one million. So you can see the speed of the machine was very different. And it only had 16 colors on the screen at one time. And in 8K, I had to get all of the, the, the human body that I could get into the game as well as all the gameplay. One of the sponsors of the conference is the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Steve Downs explains why they are funding research in this area. You know, we started this group about five years ago, and uh, early in that, we uh, got connected with some of the people who were doing serious games work and games for health, and it sounded interesting to us, and, and we took a look at it, and as we looked at the medium of games, there were several attractive things. So, for example, the penetration of games was growing and growing dramatically, and it had moved beyond the the stereotype of the uh, the teenage boy in the basement playing the shoot 'em up to a much wider audience um, and a much greater variety of games. To now, I think the stats are that uh, there are almost twice as many women over 18 using games than there are boys under 18. And so that's a, a real shift, I think, in demographics. Second thing was that we found that the technology was advancing very rapidly. Um, I think someone compared it uh, when we first got connected around 2003 or 4, compared it to the Internet around 1994, that it was starting to take off, but obviously a lot more to come in terms of the technology, and I think that's happening. The third thing is that games as a medium is very well suited to learning, and, and learning how to do something, mastering something. And, and really, you know, in some ways, it is an improvement over just flat information, you know, which people can read, but, you know, can they absorb it or will they act on it? Um, and so all those three things kind of came together for us to say, this is an exciting opportunity, and there are probably a lot of problems in health and healthcare that may lend themselves to using game technologies in some way. We don't really know, but we think that's an exploration that we want to see, and so what we want to do is kind of grow this community of people who are sort of uh, taking that journey to figure out what may, might make a difference. Some health insurers, such as Humana, are also working on developing games. David Popolo is Director of Consumer Innovation at Humana. We have uh, 11 million members as part of Humana's health insurance, uh, but what we're doing is really open to everybody. So it's not only for our members, it's actually open to anybody who wants to play, and that's where we're going. We've had uh, a lot of success with our game that we've designed. It was called the Horsepower Challenge. We just rolled out the American Horsepower Challenge last month to... Um, 100 or so schools across the nation, and it's a pedometer-based game that ties on-the-ground activity with online activity. So the pedometers actually provide step counts and becomes the currency for the online gameplay for the kids. And teams of kids from schools can compete against each other. So that's one example of a very easy game that we created using a pedometer to incite kids to do more movement through the gameplay and a little bit of competition at the same time. So that was one thing we did. We just finished um, launching a game uh, called Ops, which is a collaboration with Disney on their movie G-Force. It's coming out uh, in July. Again, a very online, on-the-ground based game. Kids go off and do missions, they come back online, report those missions, and they can move up levels uh, of being a certain agent and being awarded virtual badges and accomplishments online. So again, getting kids out there and moving and using gameplay to do that. Steve Brown of the company 3Banana is a pioneer in interactive gaming. Steve saw early success using gaming to directly affect health outcomes for patients, and he conducted randomized control trials to prove it. So we were very early in uh, 1991, 1992, developing these games for a Super Nintendo Entertainment System. I think that they look quite primitive now in hindsight, uh, 17 years later. Um, what was novel about the games at the time is actually creating game strategies that modeled the strategy for managing a chronic illness. That was a totally new idea. Of course, in a 
small niche like a children's health issue to sort of compete with the expectations set by Hollywood and big time productions was sort of an impossible task. But we were very successful within the specific niche where we really were trying to help very young kids be first introduced to some of these difficult issues. And so we, we were looking at would children be able to talk with their friends and their parents about diabetes at age seven, eight, or nine years old, where otherwise it might have been a challenge to have that conversation. And we showed that video games were extraordinarily helpful in helping people have the conversation. As a result of having the conversation, uh, children were more um, comfortable with and felt more confident in their ability to actually manage their condition and do the things that would, would make a difference, like you know, eating their dinner. <laughs> it's a very big challenge in uh, anybody who has a uh, young young child with diabetes, parents are in charge of injecting the insulin, and then uh, you need to, to beg your kid to eat, and, uh, and you need to balance those two factors. So you really need to find a way to motivate kids to be an active participant um, at a very young age. And, and gaming was just one way to start that conversation. It turned out to be very effective in randomized controlled trials. The first ever randomized controlled trials of video game content are the trials that we did in the early 90s of Nintendo games for children with diabetes. If you look at today, what's happened in gaming today, it's a very, very different world today. On one hand, the big time productions are bigger than ever and more realistic and more complex than ever and have bigger budgets than ever. On the other end of the spectrum, there are more niche products than ever because the tools are out there, the open source tools are out there. You can do very interesting things on very low budgets and get them out to a worldwide audience through the App Store on iPhone or on an Android phone from Google um, or online. Says Brown, the future is very bright. The, the progression that the Internet has gone through with you know, Web 1.0, just linking all of the documents and computers of the world together, and sort of a, but still kind of a static collection of information, to Web 2.0, which is linking people involved in those documents and making it a living, breathing, continuously evolving landscape with an order of magnitude more content and richness uh, out there, to, to Web 3.0, which is, which is just on the horizon now of linking the context of the people in all of those documents by you know, knowing who you are and where you are and what your intentions are and what your circumstances are and connecting that intelligently to data and um, services on, on the web. That has taken the power of the internet much more into, rather than being up in the cloud, being something that you're connected to in your daily life, you know, connected in, the, you know, the, the brain in your head is connected to the brain in your pocket, which is connected to that cloud now. So it's a very different world. If you look at the impact on gaming, I look at gaming 1.0 and the sort of the static pre-programmed environment as fake people and fake worlds going in uh, playing games. Gaming 2.0 is real people in those fake worlds. And now you, those are things like massively multiplayer role-playing games like World of Warcraft or Second Life, where you have real people interacting with other real people in these fictitious environments, um, but uh, exhibiting real behaviors and, 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 and having real interactions with other people and building relationships and uh, organizing and exercising leadership and social intelligence and all kinds of things uh, that are real real world traits that never existed in games before but now which are fundamental to the, to the gaming experience. The next stage of gaming which ties into the web 3.0 and the, the semantic web and the, the linked context of the, of the new web is games becoming not real people in fake worlds, but real people in the real world. In some ways, you know, sports are real people in the real world. You're not sitting in kind of a fake uh, screen and fake environment, but you're actually having a game with real people in the real world. When you start to transpose this onto health and you have real people acting in the real world, well, that's where health happens. So games that actually use your exercise and your diet and your behavior as inputs to a game strategy of your real behavior in, your, in the real world become extraordinarily powerful and interesting and even more relevant to health and health behavior as we look at how do we find ways to measure our performance in healthcare or in diet and fitness and lifestyle, the things that affect health. How do we find a way to measure it, share it, score it, and you know, make real life more like a, a game strategy? From the fifth annual Games for Health Conference, I'm Dr. Matt Bernholtz. Thanks for listening to coverage of the 2009 Games for Health Conference. 
To download this or any of the thousands of other programs in our library, please go to www.reachmd.com. From there, you can also link to get our new iPhone application and hear our XM radio stream for free. 